Parker is uh, currently the Chief Veterinarian at the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, NCBA. Um, she's previously been a practicing veterinarian, veterinarian and has worked as a staff member uh, on the House Agriculture Committee and an, and an international consultant with the United Nations at one time. She focuses mostly on issues related to animal health, animal welfare, food safety, and, and security. And she, as Dr. Meeker does, she works uh, both legislative and with regulatory agencies uh, in uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Parker holds a veterinary and uh, DVM degree from uh, Texas A&M University. Uh, Dr. Parker, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, and uh, thanks for having this webcast. This is an extremely important issue to our cattle producers, and NCBA represents approximately 230,000 cattle producers across the U.S., uh, so it's a very important topic. Um, following on with uh, David's uh, discussion, um, this feed ban, we, we had a feed ban in place since 1997. It was part of what industry, including renderers as well as uh, NCBA producers and the U.S. government, put together uh, proactively when BSC first uh, became known in Europe. And this proactive feed ban has really helped protect the U.S. cattle herd. Uh, we have proven that it's working with surveillance, uh, both with uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture's ACES surveillance of cattle, um, surveillance of, at the slaughter plants, and as well FDA's own compliance records with the 1997 feed ban. So as David said, uh, we worked against this feed ban, the new enhanced feed ban is what we're working under now. Um, it, I won't go into the details since David already covered what it prevents. It, it does um, create a lot of cost and exacerbated disposal issues that we already had. Uh, and we, we have some environmental concerns because of those disposal issues. Most of you know that any government regulations have to pass a cost-benefit analysis. So if the cost to uh, the industry for this regulation outweighs the benefits to it, they're, they're not supposed to be passed, and they are sent back to the agency for reevaluation. That happened with this feed ban. It was originally proposed in October 2005. It failed the cost benefit uh, because the benefits of in increased safety for animal health and human health uh, were so negligible and the economics or cost to the producers and the industries that handle cattle uh, were tremendous. Uh, as David said, we lost that. This was not a scientific decision. This was actually a political decision. So as of April uh, this year, the rule went into effect with the compliance part going in place in October. So when FDA actually put this uh, rule into place, they actually admitted several things that it would cause. And the next two slides, will I'll go through the ones that FDA themselves said it, the problems it would cause, and we have certainly, as uh, producer organization have already suffered the consequences of, of many of these. So David talked about the uh, new waste stream, uh, both from what used to be at the slaughter plants as well as on farm. So there's a whole new set of uh, waste that we currently have no way to dispose of. The economic impact, uh, FDA admitted that there'd be significant economic impact on a substantial number of small farmers and ranchers, and we've certainly already seen evidence of that beginning as early as last December. As well, the disposal problems. We didn't have very uh, good answers on normal disposal issues that producers across the country were already experiencing. The research and technology has not kept up with what we need. And these disposal problems have certainly been exacerbated. FDA did recognize that, but did not provide any solutions for that. Uh, they also said that this rule has a potential for collateral negative impact on other industry sec sectors, like livestock auctions and meat processors. 
Uh, we've certainly seen evidence of that um, just in, in some parts of the country where uh, renderers, because of the economic and liability costs to Zoom, decided it just wasn't worth picking up any dead livestock at all. The last bullet point, uh, FDA estimated the compliance cost as $64 million to $80 million per year. And much of this uh, cost would actually affect small entities. And as you know, the ones least likely to absorb those kind of costs. FDA also acknowledged that this could cause environmental difficulties. And especially, there are many parts of the country uh, where there aren't adequate rendering services even prior to this rule. And one thing we worry about on that is in areas where there, there is no dead stock pickup, what happens to the environment as you have a greater volume of uh, disposal on farm? FDA also has estimated that these regulations would generate an additional 28 million pounds of this prohibited cattle material at the slaughter plant. Um, and that's what David referenced earlier. And they, FDA estimated a 26 to 41 percent decrease in cattle carcasses being picked up by the rendering services. And that, that will vary significantly depending on what part of the country you're in. Uh, as part of uh, one of the CAS studies that David referenced, um, there's approximately 3 billion pounds of ruminant carcasses that result from natural causes every year from uh, natural deaths, lightning, things like that. And FDA estimated that in, in addition to those 3 billion pounds that we currently have to find ways to uh, dispose of, there's an additional 370 to 577 million pounds per year that this rule will cause new disposal methods to be done. FDA acknowledged all these, but they said that they're not the agency responsible for finding the solutions. We advocated strongly um, that the rule shouldn't be done because the cost benefit and the, there was no risk analysis done to uh, show what actual improvement in animal health and, and human food safety was. Um, and we also advocated that FDA, before, if they were going to go forward anyway, they needed to help producers and states find solutions to all these increased disposal problems. Today, that hasn't been done. They have talked about working with some states and EPA, but producers would have preferred to have solutions in place before they had to start living with the very real repercussions of this rule. So our consequences. I started getting calls from the countryside as early as December 2008, which was uh, five to six months way before the initial world was supposed to go into effect. And renderers, because of the economics of where they are and their decisions and the, and the liabilities, and there are, there are very real legal uh, liability issues, um, don't comply with this. They made the decision in many parts. They just wouldn't pick up any dead livestock at all. So that's, especially in Kentucky, is one state uh, where we have a significant number of equine carcasses and other species that there's nowhere, no pickup for them anymore. We've also um, received a lot of reports that because of the economic challenges the renderers face, um, if the renderer decided to continue pickup service, they're going to go, they went up on the price significantly, and it's been, it's run the gamut from double to uh, quadruple in certain areas. Everyone's having economic hardships at this time, so adding more costs to doing business is a, re a regulation that ha has no benefit is a tremendous concern for us. Disposal laws and options vary by state. And in many of our states, our producers, because of this rule, no longer have any legal disposal options. And for the, someone who represents the producers, we would like to dispose of our dead livestock legally, 
and in a way that's responsible both for animal health and the environment and human health. Uh, and in many states, this regulation has put them in a position where they don't have a legal disposal method. And that's something that we need to work to remedy as quickly as possible. As I said, the disposal options vary by state. And even within states, many times uh, counties have their own uh, rules. And as well as landfills. Some landfills within a county will accept dead livestock, others won't. Also, uh, some landfills, even though they'll accept them, they have quotas or maximum amounts that they will accept. I talked to a producer in, in Kentucky this last week. He said his landfill did allow a limited number, but they reached the maximum number that they could take within the first couple of months. Um, and so that is no longer an option in that particular county. Also, because um, FDA did not make it clear to Landfills and the different state EPA offices that even though they're banning this material from all animal feed, that it wasn't a hazardous waste. They, right as the day this went into effect, they finally, uh, EPA came out and said they would not regulate it as a hazardous waste. So landfills were confused, and many of them, because of the concern that there was something wrong and unsafe with this uh, to collect, they quit doing it. In addition, EPA has put out some documents that say that they will regulate a prion as a pest, but they haven't talked any more about what the details of that and what that actually means. So it's creating some confusion among the folks who have to deal with dead stock and how can they do it properly. Some examples of states. We here, Wisconsin, uh, Virginia and West Virginia have no legal options of disposal at this point. Tremendous amount of concern and problems in Kentucky where I get calls from producers almost weekly that don't know what to do with their dead stock and it's just piling up illegally uh, on their ranches and they don't know what to do, which is a very uh, difficult challenge. For example, in, in Nebraska on different disposal laws, Nebraska's law currently, you can bury, incinerate, or compost on the premises where the animal died. Or you can take it to a licensed landfill, technically. But the other part of the law says you cannot transport an animal carcass, a part of a carcass, on Nebraska roadways unless by a licensed renderer or by the owner of the vet if they've taken them to a vet clinic. So. You can't actually transport them to a licensed landfill at that time. Uh, and the, Nebraska is reviewing their statutes to hopefully find some flexibility. And this will force a lot of states to re-examine their laws and see what they can do uh, to help in this problem. Other states like Florida and Oklahoma, because of water tables, uh, there's certain limits on if you can bury them where and how far away from uh, waterways or water bodies or your neighbor's fence or how deep. And in many parts of the country, even though they say you can bury them, you, there's not enough soil that would fit the requirements for depth of burial and the amount of topsoil to put on top of a, a carcass as, as large as a cattle. Those are just a few examples. Uh, we certainly continue to get calls weekly uh, with problems, and what we're looking for is uh, solutions to the disposal problems if we're stuck with this regulation. We certainly need research and science and technology to catch up with the disposal challenges that we're having. And with that, I'll uh, turn it back over to Michael. Thank you very much, Dr. Parker. Um, Save up your questions for Dr. Parker and submit them in the chat box if you if you if you want, and we'll try to answer them later. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Number one, I guess some of you and, and I had this problem myself. I've had problems with your screen refreshing. Um, just refresh your screen, or press F5. I guess that'll do that for you um, to get your screen to refresh, and, and that should take care of it. 
Um, if you look in the chat box also, uh, Dr. Meeker has put up the link for, um, for the FDA rule uh, um, that's there for those who had questions about calculation, how the, how the cost benefits were calculated. And um, with that, let's uh, go to uh, Jean Bonhottel. Uh, Jean serves as the Associate Director for the Cornell Animal Waste uh, Management Institute. Um, she's got many years experience in solid waste management and education, um, starting out her career in corn with Cornell Cooperative.